My name's Sherwin Lindsay. I was born in Greenville, South Carolina. I've lived on this farm all my life. Um, when were you born? That's personal information, but it was 9 16 50. <laughs> now, I'm 63 years old. Just celebrated my 63rd birthday. And I'm glad I did because the alternative is not real good. I started with horses when I was eight years old, really got serious when I was 13. I had a triple A racehorse when I was 13 years old that we trained and used for other events other than racing. And from that point on, just went on and on probably over a thousand different horses and trained and broke probably about the same amount for other people during the years. I started off in the horse world uh, trying different types of disciplines. And as I did one discipline, I would discover another one that was intriguing. And every different discipline I did, I learned something from. And so I've done 11 different disciplines to world championships in paints and quarter horses. And have ridden other, other types of disciplines other than paints and quarter horses in breed disciplines. And I'm a certified equine therapist and I work with a youth group at uh, Crossroads Youth Ranch. I'm the equine person for the youth group and then I teach lessons here at this farm also. There's something about a horse and a relationship with a horse with a human that is so complex and intriguing that it draws the two together. Uh, more the man to the horse than the horse to the man unless they're really good at it. And once they become uh, knowledgeable in it, then you get to different levels of relationships with the horses and that's what's kind of been intriguing to me through the years. And then the interaction of the third person, which is when you're teaching to the student to enlighten them into the horse business and the horse relationships. Through the years, probably the most exciting thing was to win. But I passed that point a little bit now. It's got to the point when I'm able to take a person and introduce them to a relationship with a horse and them to accomplish things and to watch them develop as a horse person then that's probably one of the more rewarding things at this time in my career. Uh, I still love to compete, I still love to win, but uh, that doesn't mean that I, I'm, uh, that's all there is to it. As we've gone through the years, my favorite thing has changed. When I was riding cutting horses, my favorite thing was a cutting horse. When I was riding pleasure horses, my favorite thing was a pleasure horse. When I was riding reiners, my favorite thing was a reiner. When I was riding rope horses, my favorite thing was rope. About anything that you apply to your horses can be applied to your life, and anything that you apply to your life can be applied to your horses. Um, patience is one of the biggest deals with a horse. You can't force. You have to educate, and everything we do is based on one philosophy. You ask, you get a response, and you give a reward. If you're working with people, and you ask them to do something for you, and they respond, then they're looking for some kind of reward, and that's what the best relationship it is. It is. So that's, it's a difficult thing to uh, sometimes find the right way to ask, and it's sometimes difficult to find the right reward, but if you do put it together correctly, that's when the success comes. The secret to being a good teacher, and you being in education know this, is you gotta find the right, right way to get the communication to the person to make them understand. Some people's got a multiple paths of communication that you can tap into them so easy and they just automatically blossom into where you think you need to go on it. Then there's some people who you try everything in the world and you can't get through to them. Basically what I think happens is that people have psychological and emotional problems that block them from being able to do that type of thing. So uh, once you get that link where you're able to communicate with the people, you have to develop a relationship, good or bad or whatever. And then once you get that relationship developed, then you have the ability to make a positive move and positive steps. But without that relationship, you can't do it. Now I've had several, probably as many as four or five horses that were unbreakable, absolutely unbreakable. Went to rodeo bucking horses. One of them was a horse of the year three years in a row. 
and sometimes they just have that type of mentality that they will not allow a human to handle them. They have such a wild inbred stream in them, you know, that uh, it does not allow them to be broke. And I've had several like that. But it's a hard thing to determine whether I've not asked the right question or whether the are in the right way to get to this horse or whether this horse is not breakable at all. But there's a point in time you'll figure it out. About the time you get hurt pretty bad, you say it's time to go. Means of communication, basically, you communicate through the bridle and your hands. You communicate through your equilibrium, which is your upper body over your base, and you communicate with your legs. That's the only way you got to communicate with the horse is through, through that type of thing. So, um, in communicating with a horse, you develop skills. Beginning riders totally communicate with their hands. As you learn communication skills, if you watch a good rider communicate to the horse, you never see his hands communicate to the horse hardly at all. It's mostly done with his seat, his equilibrium, which is upper body over base, and then his legs. And uh, that, that's what tells the horse to do what he needs to do. But there's a combination of aids when you communicate to the horse. Reins with legs with equilibrium, and you become less dependent on reins and more dependent on the other as the horse and the rider develops. And I've talked with you before about this, but you know, a rider that doesn't have good skills, put on a horse that has good skills, what happens is the horse will migrate to the rider's level, all right? You take a rider that has excellent skills and a horse that doesn't have any skills, the horse will migrate to the rider's level, with one exception. You take the horse that has excellent skills, a rider that has no skills, with good instruction, the rider will elevate to the horse's level. And then that's why I always use real high level horses, my best horses to teach with, because when I'm there, I'm not gonna let that happen. I'm not gonna let somebody do something to the horse that makes it worse than, instead of better. So that way, you get the rider develop much quicker on a good horse than you do on a horse that doesn't know anything. But this, there's a little bit of another side to that too. Like I've got people that come in that are I put them on a good horse and they're really good riders. But you take them off a really good horse and put them on a horse that's not trained real good, and they're lost. They don't have the communication skills to teach the horse how to ride. So what we do, we go back and we put them on this horse and with good instructions, we teach them how to teach the horse. And that's when they become the best riders. Mr. Wallace says that the, the secret, the number one requirement for being able to ride well is the absence of fear. Do you agree with that? I don't think so. I'd have to take, I'd have to take issue with that. Um, I think a certain amount of fear is necessary. I think a secret to riding successful is knowledge, not absence of fear. I know at any point a horse can really hurt me, and I fear the fact if he does hurt me. So knowledge allows you to keep yourself and your horse in a position where you don't get hurt. But that still doesn't mean that you don't have a healthy respect or fear. And then maybe fear is not a good word, maybe respect is a better word. The first thing I would say is if you're just getting started, you don't have any knowledge. And it's better if you don't have any knowledge when you start. Start with a clean slate. Find somebody that really knows how to communicate and teach that you can develop a communication channel with and learn from there. Don't go out there and try to learn and then go back and correct the bad habits you've learned because that makes it difficult. Do you ever stop learning? No. That's a, learning is a lifetime experience. Every day, every week, I teach a lesson, I ride a horse, I pick up a little something. I think that the big thing that makes that happen is horses are totally individual. And each horse responds in a different way to a different aid. And there may be five or six ways to correct a horse to teach him what you want to teach him. So it's always a challenge to find the most effective way to do it. That's the whole point of being successful. Anything you do is you don't quit until you succeed. If you quit before you succeed, you never succeed. And that doesn't mean if you fail that you quit. If you fail, you still try and get that success. Do you ever have a bad day? Yeah, sometimes not with horses that much. I've learned if you're really having a bad day with a horse, what you do 
is you look for that one positive thing. When you get that one positive thing, quit right there. Because every day is not going to be the same. But you never quit until you find that one positive thing. One day last week I taught seven lessons. And it, every one of those lessons were rewarding. When I take a student out there and we try something, and it, you know I challenge them, difficult things. When I see the, the success that they have and see that in their eyes and their face and their demeanor, you know, I've done this and I've succeeded and I've learned something, then that's a good day. That's a real good day. When I go out there and I go in a competition, I come out and I got a pocket full of money, that's a good day too. <laughs>